questions pertaining to uh, priestly ordination and how that pertains specifically to apostolic succession. So Father Kelly will be bridging that as he enters into our topic this evening. So let's give Father Kelly a warm welcome and our full attention. <laughs> yes, I'm from the far north. I had five inches of snow at my mother's house today. Aren't you glad you're down here? <laughs> For me, this talk tonight marks the bringing together of two saints who are very important in my personal piety. I'm not referring to Clement and Ignatius, but rather to Ignatius and St. Patrick. <laughs> it's March 17th, the Feast of St. Patrick, which for a Kelly is very important. But I'm also dealing tonight with Ignatius of Antioch, a saint for whom I've had a devotion for decades. I first met him in a Greek class 40-some years ago when we were assigned sections of his letters to read. And then in the seminary and in graduate school, after that, I had the opportunity to study his work with care. Probably the clearest sign of my devotion to this saint is that one of my cats is named Ignatius of Antioch. <laughs> it's a strange litter. There were three kittens, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, <laughs> and Phoebe of Chinkre, <laughs> better known as Iggy, Polly, and Phoebe for short. I like to think that these great saints would be very pleased that their namesakes live so well in so pampered a life. <laughs> My topic this evening is Clement of Rome and Ignatius of Antioch as they viewed the ministerial priesthood. The basic issue here lies in the fact that the Catholic Church bases her authority to act in God's name on what we call the apostolic succession of the hierarchy. And this, in turn, is seen as the direct consequence of the will of Jesus himself, who selected and authorized specific men to continue his work throughout time. Now, it would be easy to assume that since this comes from the Lord himself, our present hierarchical organization of bishop, priest, and deacon ought to be identical, or at least nearly so, to that of the early church. Such a view would, of course, naturally presume a uniformity of thought and practice within the early church. But herein lies the catch. As I will try to show this evening through the works of these two great saints, Clement and Ignatius, there simply was not this lockstep uniformity of either thought or practice in the apostolic age. Even the most cursory reading of the works of these two great men, Clement and Ignatius, demonstrates that this is the case. We shall hopefully see tonight, as we examine their respective theologies, just how different their presuppositions actually were. And then, what the consequences of these differences were for their respective churches. However, before I turn to that topic, to those two great saints and to their theology, I'd like to make a few rather tangential introductory comments. During the questions that followed Reverend Dr. Moore's fine talk last week, a couple of the questions asked were based upon what theologians call the development of doctrine. This is the most orthodox and acceptable position of Catholic theology, and it posits that the Church's understanding of divinely revealed truths has grown and evolved throughout the centuries. However, 
And here is where I was a bit uneasy with some of the questions of last week. The substance of the truth always remains the same. While the grasp or the explanation of or expression of the truth changes due to the gradual unfolding of the divine mysteries in God's plan. The church insists that nothing has been added to or subtracted from the deposit of faith since the apostolic age. However, in spite of this, the mysteries revealed to Christ by his apostles are clearer now than they were then or when that they were during the first century. This is the result of the gradual clarification of these truths, the re-expression of these truths by the early fathers and doctors of the church. This, in turn, is a consequence of God's desire that his people would come to an ever clearer understanding of his revelation. Traditionally, this has been seen as the fulfillment of the Lord's promise at the Last Supper to send the Holy Spirit who would continue the revelation of the hidden depths of Jesus' message, the truth. At times, a mystery which seems implicit in the scriptures was at a later time made explicit by a papal definition. The common example that is given of this, of course, is the declaration of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception by Pope Pius IX in 1854. The great Catholic historian of the early church, or excuse me, of the church, the Jesuit father John Hardin, wrote that this process of the development of doctrine is a progressive realization and understanding of the faith an understanding which is taught by the church under the Bishop of Rome. For me, the topic that we are dealing with tonight, Ignatius, Clement, is like a pair of snapshots, pictures of two approaches or steps in that process of the development of the dogma or doctrine of hierarchy. In the writings of Clement of Rome and, Alex and Ignatius of Antioch, we are able to witness and understand two seemingly quite different opinions of how the church was to be led. While both of these two great saints spoke of what I will call a bishop-oriented hierarchy. Their individual versions of such a hierarchy were quite different. Clement envisioned a twofold hierarchy composed of bishops and deacons, collectively called at times the presbyterate. The most important function of this seems to be the celebration of the liturgy and the coordination of the charitable works of the church. Ignatius instead spoke of a three-ranked clergy composed of bishops, priests, and deacons whose functions varied according to their rank and included many more duties than those that were mentioned by Clement. The churches today concerning hierarchy is more than just an amalgamation of these two views, but it did grow from both of these positions. Now, in light of those introductory comments, <clears throat> 
I'd like to turn first to St. Clement of Rome. I begin with Clement simply because he came first historically. According to the oldest records of the church, St. Clement of Rome followed St. Slinus and Cletus as the third successor to St. Peter. Irenaeus tells us that Clement was ordained by St. Peter himself and that Clement knew St. Paul well. Clement was pope for nine years, from 88 to 97, the common era, or in the minority opinion of Eusebius. Did you ever notice how Eusebius is always the minority opinion? <coughs> from 92 to 101. We have only one writing that is now recognized as having been penned by Clement. It's his epistle to the church in Corinth, traditionally called his first epistle, since previously other works also were thought to have been written by Clement. The situation which occur occasioned this letter is quite clearly stated in the letter itself. A lack of unity was dismantling the church in Corinth. A faction of young men had led a rather successful revolt against the church's leaders and had deposed them in language that's very highly and heavily col colored by Old Testament allusions, Clement wrote this, And so the dishonored rose up against those who were held in honor, those of no reputation against the notable, the stupid against the wise, the young against their elders. For Clement, this was simply a case of an abominable and unholy schism as he says in the very first verse of the first chapter. A schism which, true to its immoral roots, was leading to strife and sedition, which alienates the people from what is right. It appears from Clement's writings that the majority of the people in Corinth had gone over to the side of the rebels. Now. Clement doesn't tell us exactly what the cause of the schism was. For him, there was no need to discuss the merits of the rebels' cause, since in his eyes, they had committed a breach of justice, which would lead not only to divisions in the body of Christ, but also to its very destruction. Clement's solution was quite simple. In the name of the Roman congregation, he demanded that the ejected leaders be restored to their former position. In his mind, this is simply a plea that the peace and union, which he says should be the hallmarks of the church, be restored. For Clement, the reason that this return to the norms was necessary was that he saw the visible church of Christ as, a totally or, as being totally organized along certain basic rules, which he posited were given by God to his people. And for Clement, whenever a person or a group such as the Corinthian rebels, departs from this body of rules. It is a violation of the will of God. Clement wrote, Now, that this is clear to us, and that we have peered into the depths of the divine knowledge, we are bound to do in an orderly fashion so that all that the Master has bidden us to do at the proper times he set, be done. In another passage he wrote that the Corinthian elders, he said, who performed the sacred service for the congregation, 
have a right to deference from them. But this had been denied. And he further commented that God, whom he called the protector and defender of those who worship his excellent name, will require the proper order be restored in Corinth. For Clement, this concept of right order or proper order becomes one of the two basic points underlying Clement's understanding of hierarchy. After beginning by noting that God created all things according to his plan, a plan which Clement calls the divine order, he then went on in an attempt to win the dissident Corinthians over to his view, giving multiple parallels to illustrate the divine order. In this, he was much like Paul, who used a variety of different examples to try to convince the people through his letters of the necessity of and the wonder of the cross and the death of Christ. So too, Clement here gives a multitude divided into three main categories of examples to try to explain the divine order. These included, first of all, Old Testament parallels in which Clement stressed the fact that the main characters of the Old Testament history were obedient to God's will. In addition, he spoke of the Old Testament priesthood and its sacrifice. And here he's suggesting that the episcopate, the rank of bishop, is analogous to the office of high priest in Judaism. Although he is not stating that the New Testament priesthood is simply an expansion of the old. His concept of order and the wondrous power of Christ go far beyond that and basically would rule it out. The second example that he gives is the Stoic doctrine of the natural harmony of the universe. Here it seems that Clement was appealing to those Greek Christians who had a Stoic background. Basically, what Clement is doing is Christianizing the Stoic view by stressing that this harmony ultimately derives from the character of God himself who created all things. The third are military parallels. Almost as an afterthought, Clement, add, Clement added a reference to the organization of an army. He wrote, not everybody is a general, a colonel, a captain, and so on, but each in his own rank carries out the orders of the emperor. Clement makes the parallelism clear. Just as one may not desert or rise in mutiny in the military, so it is within the church. And whatever the rank one has, bishop, priest, or deacon, they are to carry out the orders of God and his right order. Now, it's important to realize, I think, that these three parallels, the Old Testament references, the Stoic doctrine, and the military imagery, are not the central points of Clement's argument. He is simply using them as examples to bring the people to understand what he meant by the right order of God's universe. 
earlier I said this concept of the right order was one of two basic points Clement gives underlying his understanding of the hierarchy. This concept of the right order and the examples that he gives to illustrate it serve as an introduction for Clement's central argument, the actions of Christ himself. It is as if Clement were saying, now that we clearly see the necessity of following God's plan, let us see what is revealed to us in Christ his Son. For Clement, the decisive reason and his second major point, which demands the restora restoration of the deposed leaders in the Corinthian church, lies with Christ. He wrote, the apostles received the gospel for us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sent from God Thus Christ is from God and the apostles from Christ. In both instances, the orderly procedure depends upon and flows from God's will. Back to the right order again. And so the apostles, after receiving their orders, and being fully convinced of the rightness of them by the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, went out in the confidence of the Holy Spirit who came to them that first Pentecost to preach the good news, the good news that God's kingdom was about to come in its fullness. As Clement says, they preached in the country and in the city, and they appointed their first converts after testing them by the Spirit to be the bishops and deacons of future believers. Clement was not advancing here a new teaching. We find the very same argument, the basic schema that Clement gives in the words of the Gospel of John, where Jesus stated in chapter 13, verse 20, whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. God sent Christ, who sends the apostles to the people. For Clement, the conclusion is obvious. Since these deposed leaders had not received their authority from the community. The community, therefore, should not have and may not depose them from their place of authority. A few chapters later, Clement writes the following, And our apostles knew to our Lord Jesus Christ, that there would be strife over the title of bishop. So for this reason, because they had been given full foreknowledge, they appointed those mentioned above, and after added the stipulation that if these should die, other approved men should succeed to their ministry. And then he brings this concretely around to the situation in Corinth when he adds, surely we will be guilty of no small breach of justice to remove from their ministry those who were appointed either by them, he's referring to the apostles, or later on, and with the whole church's consent, the later bishops. Here again, <clears throat> excuse me, Clement is presenting the same argument 
It's worth noting, though, this argument is not an invention of Clements. In addition to the parallel I noted to Christ's words, there are also parallels to other texts in the New Testament. For example, to the election and the installation of Matthias in the first chapter of Acts, or to the appointment of the seven deacons in Jerusalem in Acts 6. In those cases, Clement would stress that this selection is permanent. If a man fulfills his post, he is to be supported and honored. In this, we find a parallel or an early teaching or example of the teaching of the idea of the character that's attached to the sacrament of orders. And to make his argument understandable to an even greater audience, Link, Clement linked this process of apostolic succession to the Jewish Old Testament experience. Adopting and adapting the words of the prophet Isaiah from chapter 60, verse 17, Clement wrote, nor was this an innovation since bishops and deacons had been written of long before. For thus says scripture somewhere. <laughs> He's quoting Isaiah 60, 17. I will appoint their bishops in righteousness and their deacons in faith. Now, some people get very upset about this. Some people will try to lambast Clement for quoting the Old Testament here so poorly to demonstrate apostolic succession. Let's face it, Isaiah didn't speak of bishops and deacons per se. But, before we land back on this, it does well, I think, to remember that Luke does the very same thing in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 20, when he takes Psalm 69, verse 25, and twists it around to defend the election of Matthias to replace Judas. There was a much more fluid way of applying scriptures at that time than we have today. It's worth noting that it is not at all clear in Clement's writings as to how the bishops receive their succession, as to how the succession passes down. Is it in doctrine through one teaching the other? Or is it in office through some sort of an ordination ritual? Clement never says. And I personally don't think that this should be seen it's a shortcoming in Clement's thought, since the answer to that question simply was not the issue. It was not a part of the problem that Clement was dealing with here. Instead, his problem was the disintegration of the church in Corinth. He saw that problem and in teaching the people through his letter, he came to his obvious conclusion. The Corinthians were ordered by Clement to restore their deposed hierarchy, while the leaders of the rebellion were told literally to leave the area so that they no longer would be a source of temptation for schism in Corinth. The interesting thing is that Eusebius confirms for us that this decision was accepted and implemented by the church in Corinth. Now, 
in concluding these remarks on Clement, we ought to note that Clement agrees with our contemporary concept of apostolic succession insofar as Christ is the author of this means of passing his authority on to continue his work throughout the ages. The obvious difference is, however, as to the structure of the hierarchy, do not lessen the value of this early witness that the Church of the Apostolic Era was continuing the method of appointing the clergy, that is, the hierarchy, as was mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles and in the letters of Paul. Excuse me. Let us turn to Iggy, St. Ignatius of Antioch. With this great saint, we have a completely different situation. Ignatius was the second bishop following St. Peter in the city of Antioch, which was the capital city of the Ro ancient Roman province of Syria. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was a city of importance, and such gave to Antioch, within the church at least, a level of importance. Ignatius ran afoul of the Roman authorities, and because of his crimes, in their view, he was sentenced to death during the reign of the Emperor Trajan. He was ordered to be taken to Rome to be devoured by the lions there. Tradition tells us that he was martyred in the year 105, although some will argue that it comes a bit later than that. Ignatius's place in our history comes as a result of seven letters which he wrote on the way to Rome to die. I emphasize that on the way because it is a, an expression which comes from Judaism. Being on the way was simply a term which referred to following the will of God. We find this many times in the New Testament, and we find it in the letters of Ignatius as well. He's on the way to Rome to die, and in that he feels he is doing what God wills. These, unfortunately, are all that we have from Ignatius' life and ministry directly. Others refer to him. Of these seven letters, five were written to the Christian churches, or two Christian churches, rather, in Ephesus, Magnesia, Tralsis, Tralis, Philadelphia, and Smyrna. These five churches had sent representatives to greet him as he passed through, and it seems as though he wrote a letter for them to take back to their community. Another was written to Bishop Polycarp of Smyrna, which is why, with this relationship to Ignatius, I named the second cat of that litter, Polycarp. The seventh and the most important was written to the Church of Rome, which St. Paul wrote to when he recommended Phoebe of Chincre the third member of that litter. In these seven letters, Ignatius thanks the communities for their many proofs of sympathy for him in his fate. And he also warns them against heretical doctrines. In his affectionate letter to Rome, which he wrote from the city of Smyrna, <coughs> 
He begged them to take no steps whatsoever which might rob him of his most ardent desire to die for Christ. Such a death for Ignatius was seen as the beginning of true life. He wrote, How glorious to be a setting sun, away from the world, on to God. May I rise in his presence. And later in the same letter he wrote, I fear that your love will cause me damage, for I shall have no other occasion to enter in this way into the possession of God. And then he gets rather graphic. I am the wheat of God, and I must be ground by the teeth of wild beasts, that I may become the pure bread of Christ. These letters provide for us valuable glimpses, not only into the life and the spirituality of this great saint, but also into the internal conditions of the early Christian communities. But with Ignatius, there is a completely different situation from that which we saw with Clement. Here it's not the question of an early Christian leader writing to a community under him which has a problem. Rather, in the case of Ignatius, it is a man who had been the active leader of one of the most prominent churches in Christendom, writing letters of encouragement to others as he is being taken to his execution. I'm sure that the mere drama of these circumstances undoubtedly made his letters important to those who received them. This is not to say that those to whom Ignatius wrote were free from problems. We know from the letters themselves that there were problems, in some case serious problems in these communities, problems that were just as critical to them as was the situation in Corinth, which Clement addressed. There are, for example, references to docetism in the letter to the Smyrnans. There are references to Judaizers in both the letter to the Philippians and to the Magnesians, among others. While Ignatius does address himself to these problems, many times only in passing, they are simply not his major interest as he writes these letters. Ignatius instead is writing to promote the basic unity of the church. For Ignatius, the only logical stance is to say that this unity is a necessary consequence of God having created the world and haven't created the church as well. In this, Ignatius is referring to the basic unity of God and of his works. Repeatedly, one finds in Ignatius's letters references to the unity of God, and that being the basis for his later discussion of the unity of the church. It's interesting to note, I think, that Ignatius pushes this to the point of stating that the real necessity for the church is the result of the need for union with God. As a result of this orientation on Ignatius's part, one finds in his letters a constant stream of advice 
for the faithful to remain united with both God and with the church. The church, as is evidenced by the person of the bishop. It is for this reason that in, in Ignatius's system, the bishop assumed a very important position. In effect, the bishop becomes for Ignatius the stand-in for God here on earth. Repeatedly, he makes just such an assertion. To the Magnesians, he writes, let the bishop preside in God's place. And also, writing to Polycarp, he says, I want you to be as the one who has the mind of God. Many have commented in the past that this presupposition on Ignatius's part is emphasized by his using the same word in reference to both God and man. And that word is head. He says, man is the visible head of the church on earth. While God is its invisible head in heaven. And then to develop this parallelism further, Ignatius applies to the bishop many descriptive terms and phrases which normally are applied to God himself. I'd like to look at three of these terms, these descriptive terms, since I think they are especially illustrative of Ignatius's theology of the bishop. The first of these is silence. One of the more perplexing expressions found in Ignatius's writings is his repeated insistence that the bishop ought to be silent. I've heard many say that, but <laughs> I think they're meaning it in a different way than is Ignatius. He writes to the Philippians, by being silent, he can do more than those who chatter. And to the Ephesians, he writes, the more anyone sees the bishop modestly silent, the more he should revere him. The basic reason for Ignatius' applying this criterion to the bishop, to the episcopacy, is to underscore the relationship that exists between the bishop and God. To be silent for Ignatius is a sign which should inspire reverence. It is a sign of both God and the relationship existing between the bishop and God. It's hard to understand what he's meaning, but his basic idea is that God speaks perfectly and thus needs only to say and not explain and so too should the bishop. The second term that he uses is creator. Ignatius does not directly state that the bishop is the creator but in one sense there is a direct parallelism between God as creator and the bishop as the celebrant of the sacraments. Ignatius is very clear that without the permission and or the presence of the bishop, there can be no valid Eucharists, baptisms, marriages, etc. For example, he states, all of these from the letter to the Smyrnans, Nobody must do anything that has to do with the church without the bishop's approval. You should regard that Eucharist as valid where it is celebrated either by the bishop 
or by someone he authorizes, which is clear in the text to be a reference to the priests. And he writes, where the bishop is present, there let the congregation gather, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. And further, he noted in his letter to the Ephesians, at these meetings, you should heed the bishop and the presbytery attentively and break one loaf, which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote which wards off death and yields continuous life in union with Jesus Christ. For Ignatius, by the celebration of the Eucharist, the earthly church gathered around her bishop overthrows the chaos and the power of Satan and replaces it with the one faith in God himself. Further, through the celebration of the Eucharist, the bishop helps his community, whom he epitomizes, grow together into one unified body. Thus, for Ignatius, the bishop helps in God's movement toward unity, which is the very purpose of creation. The third image that he uses is that of music. There are throughout his writings a number of musical references, and each describes in a rather poetic way the relationship of the people with their bishop. It's funny, as I was going through this last night, I had Mozart's Divertimento for Winds and E-flat playing on the Bose radio. And I couldn't help but think, ah, yes, how right Ignatius is. He wrote, it is fitting that you should live in harmony with the will of the bishop, being attuned to the bishop as the strings of a harp are tuned. To the Magnesians, he said, therefore, by your concord and your harmonious love, Jesus Christ is being sung. Now each of you join that choir, that being harmoniously in concord, you may receive the key. And he's using there the musical term, a key, you know, like the key of E flat. In unison, and singing with one voice through Jesus Christ to the Father. He also wrote, I sing the praises of the churches, even while I am a prisoner. I want to confess, and them to confess, that Jesus Christ is our perpetual life, united flesh with spirit. Now, some people have tried to dismiss this vocabulary as being merely Semitic oriental imagery of music. I would posit there's much more to it than simply that. We know that in the Hellenistic world, there was thought to be a very close relationship between music and the moral side of man. Plato, for example, emphasized the divine origin of harmony and of rhythm in music. And more than that, the Greeks thought that man was attempting to imitate the gods when he attempted to produce musical harmony. Plotinus, who lived about 150 years after Ignatius, wrote that through the philosophers man can see that music will allow one to come to a closer relationship with the good, that is, God in the Christian world. And it's worth noting that Plato used the same image as Ignatius did, 
concerning the strings of the harp and their being in tune to the harp. For me, it appears that these musical images or references were simply Ignatius's using of images then common concerning God and the individual's attempts to come closer to him. Just as contemporary Christians today speak of the heavenly singing of the choirs of angels, so too the Greek philosophers of Ignatius' time spoke of the concept of attaining perfection through music. For us, looking back through the ages to Ignatius and to his writings, these terms or images that he uses, silence, creator, music, emphasize for us the importance with which Ignatius views the bishop. Simply put, as was the case with Clement, the Ignatian hierarchy was headed by the bishop. And it also contained the presbyter and the deacon. It's interesting, I think, to note the various ways in which Ignatius expressed the interrelationships between bishop, priest, or amongst, rather, bishop, priest, and deacons. He used various sets of parallelisms. In the letter to the Smyrnans, he compares the individual to Jesus, the bishop to God, the presbyters to the apostles, and the deacons to God's law. In the letter to the Trallians, he said that the deacons represent Jesus Christ, the presbyters are priests, the council of God and the apostles, and the bishop, God himself. I've known bishops who liked that idea. <laughs> Finally, in the letter to the Trallians, he states, very simply, without the three levels of the hierarchy, bishop, deacon, priest, there is no church. Now, many have noted that groups of texts such as these demonstrate that for Ignatius, the church is a microcosm of the heavenly order, a real continuity between the visible ranks that are those that are also invisible in the church, invisible. Some have tried to dismiss this aspect of Ignatius's thought as mere platonic imagery. But it's worth noting that in Ignatius's thought, this is not a case of merely mirroring the heavenly on earth. For Ignatius, the church is real, real in all its levels, both the earthly and the heavenly. Perhaps the ultimate argument that Ignatius gives for his three-part hierarchy comes in Ignatius's words from the spirit, which he calls God's voice. He wrote to the Philadelphians, when I was with you, I cried out, raising my voice. It was God's voice. Pay heed to the bishop, the priests, and the deacons. That was the message. And then he also wrote to the Philadelphians, it was the spirit who kept on preaching in these words. Do nothing apart from the bishop. Now, to conclude these comments on Ignatius and on his view of the hierarchy, one may note that Ignatius does agree 
with the contemporary organization of the hierarchy as we know it. Bishop, priest, and deacon. But his system of theology is far from complete. He has no explanation of the origin of these three offices. Further, he has no explicit doctrine of any sort of apostolic succession. But as was the case with Clement, those weren't the problems or the issues that he was confronting. Rather, he simply states that these offices of hierarchy exist by the will of God, and without them, there would be no church. Excuse me. Now, there is one issue or point that I'm sure some of you have thought about tonight. Why don't these two saints, these two great saints, agree with each other? Their two positions seem so different. And I'm sure that there's probably somebody here today who assumes that Ignatius must be the correct one. Because Ignatius presents the same tripartite hierarchy of bishop, priest, and deacon as we have today. I think, though, that both of those points, the question and the assumption, miss the mark. For me, a valuable way to understand the differences between these two systems is to approach this question in the light of the bishop's relationships to the priests and to the deacons, as we find them spoken of in the documents of Vatican I, Vatican II, the New Catechism. Well, the church clearly teaches that both deacons and priests receive the sacrament of holy orders and thus states that both deacons and priests are configured to Christ by the indelible character of the sacrament of holy orders. The relationship that exists between on one hand, the bishop and his deacons, is essentially different from that existing on the other hand between the bishop and his priests. Deacons are spoken of as being ordained for the service to and of the bishop. In short, deacons are ordained to serve the bishop in the ranks of diaconia, a word which means simply service. It's worth noting that when the order of deacon was first established, as it is recorded for us in the sixth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, it was the twelve, the first bishops, who called for the selection of the first seven deacons to accomplish the social works of the early church so that the twelve would not, as Luke tells us in Acts, neglect the word of God, but rather could devote themselves to prayer and to the service of the word. The deacons are clearly shown as serving the bishop so that the bishop could do his real work, the word. Priests are spoken of quite differently. Priests are not ordained merely to serve the bishop, but rather they're ordained to share in Christ's hierarchical priesthood, into which the deacons are not ordained, and in which they do not share. Priests are ordained to be, as the Catechism says, co-workers of the Episcopal order for the proper fulfillment of apostolic mission, that apostolic mission that has been entrusted to the bishops by Christ. 
in the light of this difference between serving as deacons and sharing in the bishop's role by priests. The essential difference in hierarchical structure between Clement and Ignatius becomes much easier to understand. Clement's two-tiered hierarchy is composed first of those who minister Christ's hierarchical priesthood, the bishops who have it in their fullness, and with them the priests who share in it to a lesser degree. And the second tier, the deacons who serve the bishop by exercising the ministry of service and the coordination of charitable works. Now, Ignatius on the other side has a three-tiered system that it emphasizes there are three ordained ministries. The same three that we find in Clement, although not emphasized. There are the bishops who have the fullness of Christ's priesthood. They have the priest who shares in the bishop's exercise of Christ's priesthood. And we have the deacons who serve the bishop, just as Clement and Luke noted. This approach, for me at least, emphasizes that Clement and Ignatius's points of agreement ought to be seen and not simply their differences. So, how do we conclude tonight? I believe that this comparison of these two fathers of the apostolic church, a great pope, a great bishop, allow us to see quite clearly the validity of a statement that I made at the very beginning of this talk. I said, uniformity of thought and or practice was not always present in the apostolic church. It would be easy for us at this stage tonight to hypothesize that at some date in between the apostolic church and the early councils, the church in her wisdom somehow amalgam together the theologies of these two saints to produce a more complete theological explanation of ordained ministry. Now, such an amalgamation would produce a result quite similar to the hierarchical theology. The whole church is employed for the last 1,500 years But what would it be? Such a composite would include both the tripartite order of the Antiochian Church, of which Ignatius spoke, and the explanation of apostolic succession as put forth by Clement. And it would be similar to what we have today. But is that really what happened? We need much more evidence than what we have in these eight letters and what we have in the other writings of the Fathers to explain how this really came about. I don't think we can. Instead, I think we simply have to see that what Jesus said at the Last Supper was true. He sent the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit which has led the church into the truth that God willed. That brings me to the end of my talk, an end which I believe is the safest conclusion. Simply, we should note that there existed in the apostolic church at least two hierarchical systems. 
silence doesn't mean that there were only two. Each of them stressing both the unity of the church and the existence of a hierarchy which is distinct from the laity. But those two explanations differ in details. Thank you very much. Now, if any, if any of you have any questions, I'll try to ab secure, um, obfuscate it as well as I can. <laughs> We have the example of them preaching right in the very next chapter, Stephen. Stephen who gives one of the most um, spirited sermons that we have in the Acts of the Apostles. He said they were uh, to do social work. No, that was one of the things that they were, that was the reason why um, Peter says that they were to be selected, why there needed to be this second group to take care of the widows, to take care of the um, the Greeks in the church, but that doesn't mean that that's all they did. We know right from the very next chapter that they preached as well. Anyone else? Father, your, the quote that you gave from Ignatius when he used the term Catholic Church, is that the first reference that's ever been that we can trace back? I don't know. Sister, do you know? It is. It is. It is. I, I thought it was, but I wasn't 100% sure. Second question. The, the people from, like, Newman, were Well, I was privileged to be taught by um, Father Jolene Hart at the University of, well, he was at Marquette. He's now at Fordham University. And Father Lean Hart has this wonderful way of expressing things. He said that it's sort of like comparing how a Greek would cook chicken to how an Italian would cook it to how an Oriental would cook it. They're all different, but it's still chicken. <laughs> you know, and I think that the differences that are present, you know, have to be seen as merely differences in expression, that they aren't, you know, at the their heart, differences in doctrine or difference in belief. But expressions of it. You know, as I tried to show toward the end here. <coughs> The differences between a tripartite and a bipartite hierarchy can be seen as simply expressions of the interrelationship of the bishop you know, to the people who are a part of the hierarchy. Scott Hahn would say, well, the Catholic Church got that right, you know, because he was very anti-Catholic. Get that right. And so pretty soon he was pretty convinced. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, I got a question. The bishops are the successors to the apostles and receive their authority through that succession. How do they provide for the removal of bishops who weren't doing their job or in disagreement? Because they did have that problem in the early church, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, but they did. Oh, but they did. <coughs> One of the great um, penances of my um, graduate training was the um, Syriac language. And some of the things that we read there were, you know, basically dealing with when you had a bishop 
who simply wasn't fulfilling the job of being a bishop as he ought to. And the um, consensus was he's removed as a bishop of authority, but he still shares in the um, role or the relationship to the ministerial priesthood of the apostles, which is very much like what we say today concerning a priest who is lassized. Now, we say even a lassized priest has the right to absolve a dying person. They still have you know, the ability, the authority, and the power of the sacrament within them, even though they are removed from the exercise of the office and the norm. So too it would be with a bishop, at least in the Syrian church. Anyone else? question is about the transitory deacon, um, diaconate versus the permanent diaconate. I was ordained a deacon, but the full consensus of the church was that I would become a priest. You know, there was no difference in my ordination ceremony from um, one of the guys who was ordained with me, who never did go on to become a priest. Now, he's still a deacon, and he's functioning as a deacon. He basically became a permanent deacon. So now, you're ordained to the diaconate. And um, one of the men who was ordained a priest the same year I was had been a deacon for 12, 14 years, a, a permanent deacon. His wife died. He had money all over the place. He quit his job and paid for his own education to go to um, seminary to get the courses he needed. And he was then ordained a uh, priest for the Diocese of Youngstown in Ohio and served as a priest for 12, 14 years till he died. So this idea of temporary versus permanent, it's what it seems to be the decision is going to be, but it's not necessarily binding you to one or the other. Yes. No, it's a part. It's a. It's a part. It's not a vow. It's a solemn promise that is made as a part of the diaconate ordination. Anyone else? Father, did they have deaconesses uh, assisting the bishop in those days? Any theory? Well, we have deaconesses mentioned for us um, in the 16th chapter of Romans. Paul speaks of Phoebe of Chicre, after whom my third cat is named. <laughs> Um, but we don't know what is meant by deaconess there. We know there were deaconesses. Some people hypothesize that they were by the ministries that are spoken of, they're carrying out women who would take care of the women who were just baptized, helping them you know, as the baptismal ceremony continued, dressing them and so on for propriety. But we don't know. We know there were deaconesses. We don't know really what that meant. Okay. Um, I have, this is more of a comment. That, uh, the question is, going back to Clement, you had mentioned his relationship to Paul, and you, you did a really wonderful job of pointing out some very Pauline aspects of his teachings, although they were rather Romanized in some aspects. Um, but one of seeing that Rome is an apostolic see that can count two of the apostles um, as its founder, um, it is tradition holds that Clement is, uh, uh, was taught by Peter and probably ordained a bishop by Peter and therefore possibly chosen along with Clytus and Linus uh, um, as his successors. Is that correct? 
No, as as bishops, the successors was elected when the Pope himself died. Yeah, okay. But maybe he had it in mind. But either, either, either way. Um, Many people yeah. assume that John Paul II has, in the people that he has selected as uh, cardinals for well, a name whom he would like to see as Pope. Well, they may be seeing that it, wasn't, it hadn't been done before, and Peter maybe had his own ideas about how it was going to be done. But um, but you, you had mentioned that uh, the what Peter had said about the deacons, and so we could, we could probably safely assume that what um, Clement was teaching in regards to the bishops and the deacons was directly in line with what Peter, he may have learned from Peter, right? Um, I would still reserve that the Holy Spirit could have led the church into a different truth, you know, or into a fullness of the truth. Not a different truth, a fullness of it. Mm -hmm. You know, in the intro. We don't know. Yeah. Silence is there. We don't, we can hypothesize. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. It's like some people hypothesize, you know, a relationship between Ignatius and Polycarp, which is different from what others would say. You know, it's their personal opinion. Anyone else? Thank you very much. We'd like to thank you for being with us this evening. We remind you that next week, Father Daniel Callum will be addressing us in reference to priestly celibacy, and that will be the fifth of our lectures. And Veritas Books is here with us this evening, and certainly we invite you to be on our mailing list in reference to many other events here at St. Thomas. Thank you so, so much for coming. We'll see you next week.